Joshua, Joshua Cohen, has written 11 books, including novels, short fiction, and non-fiction, called, quote, a major American writer by the New York Times. He received the National Jewish Book Award for Fiction and the Pulitzer Prize for the Netanyahu's. Sitting to his left is Mayan Eitan. Her first novel, Love, was published in Hebrew in 2020. Her English translation won the National Book, uh, Jewish Book Award for Hebrew Fiction in Translation. And her second book, The Scream, was published in Hebrew in May. And of course, Mayan is a co-editor of the Tel Aviv Review of Books and in charge of our uh, literary and fiction uh, publications. The moderator of uh, the debate is Sam Sussman, <coughs> co-editor of the Tel Aviv Review of Books, based here in New York, our man in America. We all need an uncle in America, of course. <laughs> he has contributed fiction and non-fiction to Harper's, Descent, The Forward, Haaretz, and the Tel Aviv Review of Books, where he is a contributing editor. He is currently working on a book based on a memoir essay in Harper's magazine. Sam, over to you. Great, thanks, Gilad. I'm very excited to have this conversation. Uh, so fun to chat with so many people tonight. Um, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to talk for a little while. Each of these writers is going to read some of their work, and then we're going to do Q&A. Um, rather, rather, then we're going to do Ruby, and then we're going to do Q&A. Yeah, very uh, short Ruby. And then <laughs> oh, we didn't say short. So that's how it's going to go. So as you have questions, this is a participatory event. We want everyone to be involved. Um, so think of your questions. Um, so here we are in Brooklyn, talking about Israeli literature, and to have this conversation about the connections and relationship between the Israeli world of literature and ideas and the American and American Jewish world of literature and ideas, we really couldn't have two better people than Mayan and Josh. Um, if the Tel Aviv Review of Books were a novelist rather than a magazine, it would look like you guys. Um, you each write... <laughs> It would. Um, you each. Yeah. Glasses. It would aspire. <laughs> Not so easy. That's very kind, Ruby. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so each of you write in English and Hebrew. Publish, uh, publish in Hebrew. Um, you have readerships in America and in Israel. Um, I let's just start by. I want to ask you, how do you think about your identity as a writer? Is it American, Jewish, Israeli, international, all of the above, none of the above. Neti, Mayan, if you want to start. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, um, well, I write primarily in Hebrew. Um, I translate what I write sometimes, not always. Um, so, so I would say that I, am, I definitely consider myself to be a Hebrew writer primarily um I'm, I'm not sure about the jewish part because uh, this book my book uh, it is it is filled with the uh, with literary allusions and quotes and i was trying to think earlier whether i have something from the bible which is for me you know not only for me the major jewish source right and i think the answer is no I have more what you would call um, like quotes from or, or uh, allusions to, to um, international literature than I have to um, Jewish sources. Um, but, but I write again in Hebrew, and this is something that is very important uh, for me, even though it doesn't make sense market-wise, uh, probably. Um, but um, but I, I guess I do consider myself uh, and my writing to be part of that specific tradition. What about you, Josh? I do you quote from the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that, um, I, you know, for me, I, I like to deny everything. It's always a good stance to have. I think, all right, you know, I think a lot about, for, for a little bit of time, you know, I was uh, her tenant. 
And my uh, cat still thinks very fondly of Josh. Well, we're, we're, we're going to go where this. We're, we're going to take it. Th- we're going to take it there. And um, and she has a, a, a lovely cat named Rue. Right. As in, Rue like French street. Or Rue but, the day. Or Rue the day, <laughs> yeah. which is what I learned. Yeah. Um, and um, and uh, and in being in the in very lovely apartment with wonderful books and, Thank and you. yeah. Um, it, it was warm. It was maybe August. Or it was no, summer, it was uh, it was warm, yeah, it was. but it was uh, November. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so fact check this. Celebrate it was yeah. warm. Oh, and 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 I was there, and you know, I was writing. I was really, I was writing a lot, and I was, I was kind of doing well. But every night there would be that like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> And I was like, okay, is this cat gonna die? Like, you know, whatever. I texted you. <laughs> it, it took me three right, right, days and, and to just, text me. It, well, because I was like, it's good. As, it's a cat. It can take care of itself. It's you know whatever. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and then it just got louder and louder. And I was like, what the fuck is going? On? You know, I thought was I not feeding it the right food? Was I like not putting enough water? Like was I whatever? You know. I was a, I learned a, a wonderful Hebrew word, which is yachum, which is to be in heat. And uh, the cat was deeply in heat, and it had to be dealt with. Yeah. I'm not saying this is your fault. I'm just no, I'm just no, telling a story. No, no, just adopted the cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She had to go through surgery, so the, the yeah, yeah. And, um, and there were, where I'm going with this is, you know, sometimes you're a cat. And you feel these urges bubble up that you don't understand. And you moan. And you wait for someone to make an executive decision to cut some shit out. And that's, in my position, the diasporic position. And that's where I I feel like I live as a writer. Just on the balcony. Yeah, I would have never, never imagined you would have... Bring, brought up this story. Sorry, it's a beautiful cat. Yeah. It is a beautiful cat. It's a beautiful cat, cat. You did, and you did the right, you, I, you know, I was the one who failed. And I took a up. taxi from I know, Jerusalem. I know, I know you did, I know yeah. you did. I know. But my, my point is, is, that there, is that is that there is a yearning in, 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 um, in my being in Israel, which is a place that I've been many, many times, spent an enormous amount of time in. I mean, it's the country that I've spent most of my time besides the United States. Or I would say the country I spent the most amount of time besides New Jersey, <laughs> and um, and and I'm still um, a, a cat in heat, and that's a product. When you write, w- when I'm there, okay. and that's still a product of, of kind of who I am and how I was I was raised. So I'm fine until about five six p.m. Yeah, and then it's out on the balcony, and then it's you making the noise, and then you know who I am when I'm in the states. And I lived for five years in Michigan. I don't have a pet, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm Kafka's monkey. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> from a report from the Academy. Yeah, that's yeah, the monkey yeah. we're yeah. talking Red about. Yeah. Red. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so inter- interesting story. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, I, this actually goes very well into the next question I wanted to ask you. Uh, um, no. You're always writing about these Jews who seem, okay. you do deny everything, yeah. who um, seem homeless or displaced, or as you now would put it, a cat in heat. Um, so the Netanyahu's, we have a kitten, a kitten, a kitten, a kitten yeah. in heat. Yeah, we have the Yahoo's who are completely out of place in America, semi exiled from Israel. We have Ruben Bloom who is. Uh, sort of lost in upstate New York as a Jew. I grew up in upstate New York as a Jew. I understand why he's lost. Um, in Moving Kings, you've got uh, these Israelis who are sort of trying to escape their condition. They come to New York and they're totally out of place. And that novel, you've, you've got this other character, King, David King, who sort of, he seems like he's well situated at the beginning and by the end he's in Mexico and he's wondering if Campache is the new Israel. Mm-hmm. He can't come back to New York, he can't go to Israel. Um, so you, you seem really interested in this question of displacement. Is there an irony or a tension in writing about Jewish homelessness in a moment when it would seem in historical terms that Jews are, are more situated, have more autonomy, 
than other times? Do you feel that tension? I don't know if it's a Jewish condition. I mean, I, I think anyone who feels at home wherever they are is crazy. I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know how one could feel at home with the forces arrayed against any individual in this, I don't even want to call it a culture, in this pig buck of a universe. <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't, I don't recognize it. Like, I don't, the idea that one could feel very much at home and very, and very comfortable and, and that one's interests are respected and that one's use of one's time to pursue beauty or, or, or thought or is, is in some way valued. I mean, no, this is a, I mean, like, it's not a Jewish thing. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, to be, to be a true human alive now is to feel completely alienated. Okay, so speaking of being completely... And if I'm wrong, then you're an idiot. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the kind of thing. It's like anyone who tells me that, like, that's an alienated position, which is one that I've heard my entire life, right? That it's an alienated position, that that's a position of, of, of you know, it, it doesn't get along, right? I've just, I've learned that that is, it's, it's just, that's just another person who's trying to poison me. So speaking of people who are well-adjusted, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maya wrote a, a beautiful novel about a prostitute, um, and I wondered if you would read a little bit from it. Yeah, I, uh, I will read the first uh, few pages. Um, it's the first chapter. Uh, the book is divided into two parts. What's the book called? The book is called Love. Uh -huh. um, the uh, first part is called word, Words or Whores, in Hebrew, Milim Zonot. The second part is called Love. And I will read the first chapter. It's very short. You didn't have any friends. You had a terrific love. You had long legs, big tits, a flat belly. No, you were fat. You came from ruined homes, well-off families. Your parents were madly in love with each other. Your father was an accountant, a kibbutz member, homeless, a linguistic professor at a university. He loved you like his youngest daughter. You were an only child. You were born to a large family after years of treatments. You were adopted, immigrated from Ethiopia. You were good at math. You majored in accounting. Hebrew literature, kinesiology. You wanted to work with children, become a lawyer. Your mother was a drug addict, sobered up without help. Your uncle was a doctor. No, he was in jail for attempted murder. You were blonde. In summer, the ends of your hair were bleached white. No, your hair was as black as a raven and curly. You were born in St. Petersburg. No, no. Your parents came from America. You were born in the suburbs. You replied to them in Hebrew when they talked to you in a jumble of foreign languages. You spoke Russian until you were seven. Then you forgot it, the snow too. You knew no other language but, but Hebrew. You refused to answer your grandparents when they spoke Amharic to you. You pretended not to understand them. Your father, the accountant, raped you in his office. Your grandmother kept the key from the 48 war. You were the good granddaughter, the prettiest girl in school. You had eyes that turned violet when you were angry, that you made sure to close on your first kiss. You had sex. You never came. No, you came every single time. You hated swallowing, but did it anyway. You liked it so much, you stopped in the middle to run to the bathroom and stick your, your fingers down your throat just so you could taste him again. You spat. Two months later, you jumped off a high rise. You were admitted to a psychiatric hospital. You arrived at the ER with low electrolytes and acute liver failure, but they pulled you right back from the, aid, from the edge. Lucky you. You spent a week in the ICU, then returned. Now you had money. You bought nice clothes, toys for, for your nephews and nieces, sponges so you could work through the months without stopping. When you ran into each other in the car, someone getting in, someone out, you didn't smile. You laughed. Your laughter was so loud that your neighbors got sick of it. You pretended to moan while you wept miserably. You wept miserably. 
When you returned home and removed the makeup from your face, it blended with tears of happiness. When you went out with your childhood friends, you ordered cheap drinks, the more expensive ones. You didn't have any friends. You had a boyfriend who was a computer programmer, and you worked only when he was on reserve service or abroad for work, and you talked of getting pregnant, but you weren't the pill and didn't tell him. You liked women. You liked men. A lot. You didn't like anybody. You were pretty, you had normal skin, freckles, chapped lips, and you clipped your nails until your fingers bled because you were afraid that you might hurt someone. You didn't want to hurt anybody. You wanted to kill them all, you wanted to shout. One time you screamed, but it was a mistake and you did not repeat it. You kept your mouth shut. You had sex in public restrooms, dance clubs, on the steps of the lifeguard tower on the beach, in a luxury hotel, in your own bed. You got in the car that waited for you in the evenings with the same ease that you got out of it in the morning. What did you have to lose? You didn't have anything. Thank you. You read it in Hebrew, right? <laughs> Thank you. Well, the language is so beautiful. Um, the contradictions within the text are so rife. Um, the passage you read is so powerful that we could easily forget the title that you shared with us, which I believe is Words Are Whores. Yeah. So I want to ask you, you know, in this, in this book, there are all sorts of sly tricks, contradictions, linguistic. Um, is there a parallel here between the promiscuousness of the prostitute and the promiscuousness of the writer? Um, definitely. I mean, I mean, I think it's a very obvious parallel. Both use, and you might also say abuse. Um, uh, I mean, with writing, it's it's obviously words, but actually, the the words are. Uh, that um, title, it's actually only a half of a line from a poet by, um, by a, an Israeli uh, poet, Tuvia, Tuvia uh, Rubner. Uh, and, and the complete line goes something like, in, in translation, uh, words are whores after the death of, or after death, so in Hebrew it's milim zonot achre and it's taken from a, a poem uh, about the death of his uh, son. So, so the idea behind, uh, um, what I think of as the idea behind this line, uh, words are whores after someone dies, is that, um, um, I mean, and he also goes on to say something along the lines of, uh, of uh, one says, uh, uh, flowers, summer, uh, uh, nice uh, weather. So, so the idea is that that I mean, some instances of, of, of mourning and, and 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 after some um, um, some kind of terrible or traumatic events, uh, language becomes void, right? It, or or you you expect it to become void. Uh, and, and still, exactly because words are whores, uh, it doesn't. One still says, or one is still able, at least according to this poem, one is still able to experience uh, wind, beautiful uh, flowers, the summer um, evening, I don't know. Um, so so, um, so that when I use this tiny part of, of the line, uh, to to frame what um, what I uh, had in mind when I had in mind when I when I wrote the book uh, was indeed I mean it it was a combination I guess of the idea that that what I do is as a writer and especially in this book which is again filled with quotes and and paraphrases and and allusions to so many different literary sources. Um, w what I do as a writer is 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 definitely uh, something that that can be thought of as as promiscuous, right? My approach to language and and, and to other sources of literature is 
is basically horish. Uh, I use and abuse it. Um, but but also when I said when I when I use this part of, of, of the line from the poem to uh, uh, to to sort of frame at least the first part of the book, I really did mean that um, uh, there is something uh, absolutely terrifying and terrible about the kind of experiences that I describe in the book. Um, and still you use language to describe it, right? And it can somehow be both completely void and meaningful. Um, and I think this exists in the poem that I refer to in the title. Um, I don't know, does it answer your question? Yeah. I think so. Okay. I want to ask you more about the translation, mm -hmm. but before we do that, Josh, are words whores? I, I haven't met all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think one of the things that, that's, that's kind of, you know, it's really virtuosic in the translation, but it's also a loss, right? So much of the book is written in, in you know, we don't have pronouns like this. It's written in second person plural. Right. And not only is it written in second person plural, but it's written in second person plural feminine. feminine. So, you know, so you have this idea of this collective second person female heroine, you know, this you, yeah. that's a collective you that, you know, that, that maybe you, you hear when, you know, you hear the concatenation of it in English, you hear the repetition of the you and you, you get a sense of that. But, um, but the way in which it's a, like a, a, a roll call of a, um, of a cohort, Right, like I think, I think is 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 the power of, um, it's the power of, of of words, but it's also the, you know, it's the power of of of, of prostitutes. I mean, like you know, in, in a way, you know, this idea of words, whores, like whores, is you know, and I know this negative connotation, but like these are, you know, uh, yeah. There's the there's this there's this strong sense of this collective heroin at the at the. Know, at, at the bus station that um, that that begins to upend I think your idea of not only who does that work but also who comprises these neighborhoods and and yeah but the words I deal with they just do what I say so Ryan let's talk about the process of you translating this work because what you read was published in your own translation right. in the Tel Aviv Review of Books and then a while after that shortly right. there, Last month, months ago, you won the Jewish Book Council um, Award for Hebrew Fiction in Translation for translating your own book, which is quite the feat. Um, I'm curious, how did your relationship to your novel change as you translated it from Hebrew into English? Um, it was the, the translation itself uh, was a very, uh, like a very brief process. We're among friends, right? I think so. Okay. So, uh, we had a party, uh, me and my, um, uh, we hosted a party, me and my then boyfriend, and it ended really late, uh, and he went to sleep, and it was, I think it was probably after midnight. Uh, I was probably at least tipsy, maybe drunk, and bored. Uh, and I just opened the computer, and I started translating the book. And by the time I ended, I mean, by the time the night ended, actually, I was halfway through, um, so it took me a night and then uh, another couple of weeks to actually finish the translation, revise it, and and, and send it uh, to agents. Um, but so, so I think I wasn't really. It was done on a whim, and I wasn't really thinking about the kind of losses that you suffer as a translator. Um, but as the publication date approached. Um, I did start to feel the 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 kind of real sorrow. I think. Do you ever translate yourself? No. No. Uh, it's I really mean, from English to English. Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah. <laughs> Not to Hebrew. Never to <laughs> Hebrew. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's really it's it's a terrible thing. I mean, I uh, I I hate translating. It's 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 just I feel so guilty all the time for. Um, for everything that you lose in the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have, I have in the book um, a, a chapter called now, um, 
Hmm, driving in a fast car. How does that song go? That Tracy Chapman. Tracy Chapman, fast yeah, car. Yeah, fast car. I don't know. I have a line from. It was a a, a, a line from a Alif Einstein song mm -hmm. in the Hebrew original. So he's like the the I guess the Israeli. What would you say? Like yeah. Uh, Israeli Bob Tracy Dylan. Chapman. <laughs> no, but the Israeli Bob Dylan. Because that that's exactly the point. He's not the Israeli well, Tracy well, yeah. Chapman. Well, maybe um, not. <laughs> but uh, but and and uh, and when you have this double perspective mm -hmm. uh, of 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 uh, of the two languages, and it, it, in this sense, it doesn't matter really that I also wrote the book in the original language. Uh, just the sense of loss is just terrible. I would never, uh, I mm -hmm. would never translate anything else in my life. That's the experience. But then, I mean, it won the prize, which was, which was a very surprising um, moment for me because I really, I was, uh, I was, I was devastated when the book came out in English. I was. I felt so guilty. Mm. 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 Um, before we, we move on, um, Josh, you have something you want to read as well. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read something. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's do that. I, I feel bad keeping people waiting. People have patience. Okay. I was just gonna read a little, a little thing. Um, yeah. Just when it seems that there is nothing more to say about the Netanyahu family, along comes the Netanyahu's a novel by Joshua Cohen, an American Jewish author with a connection to Israel who speaks Hebrew and bemoans that other American Jews generally don't. The novel has a tantalizing subtitle, blah, blah, blah. An account of a minor, it doesn't matter. The episode in question, taking place in 1959-1960 at Corbin College in New York State when Reuben Blum, an American historian, is tasked with hosting historian Ben Zion Netanyahu and his family when the latter is invited to the college for a job interview. Unsurprisingly, a balagan ensues. A mess. Corbin College and Rumblum are fictional. The two are stand-ins for Cornell College and the literary scholar and critic Harold Bloom. We learn this in a credits and extra credits section, essentially a postscript to the end of the novel. JC tells us that toward the end of his life, Bloom had told him about, quote, the time he was asked to coordinate the campus visit of an obscure Israeli historian named Ben Zion Netanyahu, who showed up for a job interview and lecture with his wife and three children in tow and proceeded to make a mess. Cohen explains, quote, of all of Harold's tales, this was the one that stuck with me the most, perhaps because he was one of the last he ever told me, and following his death in 2019, I wrote it down, and in the process found myself having to invent a number of details he'd left out, and due to circumstances I'm about to explain, having to fictionalize a few others. End quote. I can't remember ever reading anything quite like this at the end of what is clearly a work of fiction. It comes across as strangely apologetic, and one wonders why Cohen thought it necessary. Taken in isolation, though, this postscript is the most interesting part of what, despite its promise, is a deeply flawed novel. In contrast to its ending, at the start of the novel, Bloom, nothing like Bloom, Cohen reminds us, declares that, quote, unlike the religious who have the chutzpah to put words into the mouth of God, I'm only recalling events at which I was present and the time elapsed between those events and the current moment has been considerably shorter than, say, the span between the creation of the universe and the exodus from Egypt, and shorter even than the span between the ministry of Christ and the composition of the canonical gospels. It's important to keep this in mind, as throughout the book I kept asking myself, were the Netanyahu's really that bad? Did Bloom think they were? Blum, our narrator, certainly does. Early in the novel, he takes pains to remind us that he is, quote, a Jewish historian, but not an historian of the Jews. Even more, he's the first Jew in the whole entire school faculty, and as far as I could tell, student body included. Despite having no expertise in medieval jury, Netanyahu's area of specialism, Bloom is co-opted onto the hiring committee, largely because the applicant is considered, quote, one of your own, and is tasked with chaperoning him during his visit. The visitor's name, quote, meant nothing to me or to anyone, not even the surname, which was still a generation away from its infamy. At the time, and especially in America, it was unknown, or beyond the unknown. It was foreign, esoteric, an alien name, eons old, but also from the future, a name equally from the Bible and the funny papers. Some background is necessary, and Cohen provides this in the form of two letters addressed to Corbin College, 
These missives are the most compelling sections of the novel. The first is a letter of recommendation from uh, Rabbi Dr. Chaim Hank Edelman, the president of Dropsy College for Hebrew and Cognate Learning, a real-life institution based in Philadelphia, which describes Ben, this is still the father, as a major statesman and political hero. The second letter is from Peretz Lavavi, lecturer in Assyriology, Aryanology, and Indo-European Linguistics and Philology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Far more circumspect in tone than Edelman's panegyrics, Lavavi's letter provides the Netanyahu family story. Rabbi Milikovsky, a Zionist activist with the pen name Netanyahu, arrived in Palestine in 1920, but then was sent around the world to raise funds for Vladimir Jabotinsky's revisionist Zionist movement. Ben Zion, one of Milikovsky's nine children, went to the Hebrew University where he focused on the history of the Jews of Spain. Anguished by the perceived apathy of other scholars, Ben Zion left the Hebrew University without finishing his PhD and became Jabotinsky's secretary. After Jabotinsky's death, Netanyahu completed his PhD at the aforementioned Dropsy College before returning to Jerusalem. Finding himself still a marginalized figure, he was eventually forced to seek work in America. It's a promising start. But these letters aside, the Netanyahu's don't make an appearance for another 100 pages. Instead, we are treated to sub-Philip Rothian passages dealing with parental visits and the travails of the Blum's daughter, Judy. Interspersed with these dim passages are Blum's own investigations of Benzion's scholarship. I'm going to skip the quote here. I'm going to skip the quote in a little bit. Skip the quote. There's a lot of quotes. 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 Blum's personal impressions of the Netanyahu's are similarly scathing. Cohen has set them up as the cartoon villains that the American liberal reader would want and expect. Still, given that Cohen makes clear that he found himself, quote, having to invent a number of details, I was constantly wondering what was made up and what was not, which really shouldn't matter when reading a novel, but felt like it did on the account of the aforementioned postscript. What about Yonatan? What about Jonathan, Benjamin, and Nido, the Netanyahu children, 13, 10, and 7 years old at the time of this minor episode? In one of the better scenes in the novel, following some bad behavior, Ben Zion, there's a long quote, there's a long quote, there's a long quote, let's skip this quote, let's skip this quote. This family sows chaos wherever they go, culminating in a strange and sexually charged finale featuring the young Judy. While I'm not sure that one can draw much insight into the life of Israel's current prime minister from his childhood appearance in this novel, it is clear that, as much as Ben Zion is a significant figure in his own right, the novel would be of less interest without our knowledge of the Bibi that Benjamin was to become. That's what makes the few passages that feature the Netanyahu children intriguing, albeit without much by way of narrative significance. Ultimately, the Netanyahu's feels like a simplistic polemic targeting the rowdy, uncouth Netanyahu's. The blurb declares that Benzion, quote, lays waste to Bloom's American complacencies, but I don't think Cohen is very successful in this. After his interview with the Corbin committee members, Benzion confronts Bloom about the reasons that he was placed in the latter's charge. He needles Bloom about when he will get his honorarium before finally saying, quote, and if the situation were reversed and your feet were in my shoes and you came to Israel, I'm not positive I could get you a job, but I'd do absolutely everything to find you a good, a good apartment. And in a war, I'd die for you. It's a tantalizing observation because perhaps this is revisionist Zionism at its core. Absolute Jewish solidarity in all circumstances. It must have been so strange to someone like Blum. And in 2021, with the Netanyahu name so familiar, it must be even stranger to the contemporary Blums toward whom this book is so obviously targeted when such notions get to dismissed as racism. Without understanding the Netanyahu family history and the actual lived experience of so many Jews in the Gentile world, experiences which gave rise to the revisionist ideology and indeed other streams of Zionism, one cannot understand contemporary Israel. Cohen is undoubtedly a talented writer and with this book had the opportunity to give metaphysical resonance to the encounter between two major Jewish centers of our time it is a shame that it doesn't quite come off. So that was a review by, by Alex Stein called Meet the Yahoos, which was published in the Tel Aviv Books in summer 2021. <laughs> First time I heard of this publication. <laughs> and this now is me, myself, I, Joshua Cohen, doing what I do worst or best, according to this reviewer, which is adding a postscript. <laughs> Specifically, I would like to highlight this phrase of the review, quote, absolute Jewish solidarity in all circumstances. Again, absolute Jewish solidarity in all circumstances. A phrase that the author attempts to link to the historical movement of so-called revisionist Zionism before going on to link it to contemporary Israel in general, after commenting that such solidarity often seems strange, even, quote, racist in the United States, or if you prefer, in the diaspora. I don't want to go so far as to claim 
that by agreeing to support this great publication that trashed me, <laughs> I am in fact demonstrating absolute Jewish solidarity in all circumstances. <laughs> and so saving the reputation of my fellow diaspora Jews. And neither do I want to be explicitly political in this literary forum and claim that the parochial and religious definition of absolute Jewish solidarity in all circumstances that's being encouraged and even enforced by Netanyahu's current administration is bound to fail. Instead, I will just point out what seems obvious to me as a writer and reader and as a former student of the parochial and religious, that the phrase absolute Jewish solidarity in all circumstances includes circumstances of disagreement, of dissent, of cross purposes and contradiction. That to quote Benzoma, not Benzona, but Benzoma, all circumstances include all our days and all our nights and the world to come, even unto the circumstance of the Messiah, whose arrival will herald the day when smart, passionate literary journals like this one won't have to wander the streets begging for money. <laughs> Well, Josh, we're very grateful for your solidarity, and um, whatever its extent. All circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> um, we want to get time for Q&A and people to engage these two great writers. But before we do that, um, we're going to have Ruby come up. Um, so, one. Very short. Yeah, one, very Ruby, short. why don't you take the seat? I like the seat. tall chair. It's fine. Oh. I can introduce Ruby. Um, I don't really need this. I studied with Ruby. Okay. I was lucky to study with Ruby. And um, I'll say as by way of introduction um, that his wonderful novel, The Ruined House, won the Sapir Prize, which for those who don't know is Israel's most prestigious literary award. Um, Ruby is a remarkable writer, a very gifted teacher, um, teaches through a Jewish fellowship called Laba at the 14th Street Y and many other places as well, and is really a pioneer and a leader in drawing on traditional religious texts to make contemporary Jewish fiction. So he's someone who has a lot of ideas about what we're discussing here tonight, and he has a wonderful and strong connection with the Tel Aviv Review of Books. Um, he's given us a wonderful short story called The Manuscript, which is online, which everyone can read. Um, Ruby, let's just start with an open question. What strikes you here in this conversation about um, Jewishness, Israeliness, literature? You're an Israeli writer who writes mm. in New York. In Hebrew, um, yeah. what 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 strikes you about this project? Uh, mostly the, the very high presence of moaning in the there was a lot of moaning, which is I, I, I find very interesting and, and uh, to me this was a, a, this was a wonderful Jewish moment because of the the Balagan. This whole the fact that we sat here and allowed this to happen and were riveted for a long time. <laughs> um, the fact that Josh speaks about basically the idea of never being in the place. Never. The opposite of Alephet Yoshua's fantasy of normal and fantasy. I mean, normal. On the other hand, there's Mayan, who's a very strong, important voice in contemporary Hebrew literature, who says, I actually looked up my own work and saw that there is no Bible in it, which is a very interesting, it's not like you decided there's not going to be a Bible. So happens that there was nothing biblical about my work. Hmm, interesting. So in one hand, I think this is maybe very much being at home in a language so that you don't sit there sweating, oh, I'm going to put this reference and that reference. On the other hand, comes Josh and speaks about, oh, endless sense of agitation and never be normal, never been in the place. And the, this, the fact that there was such a, such a great uh, vibe between these two voices and, uh, and that we were also riveted. For me, this speaks volumes. This is maybe the spirit of the Tel Aviv Review of Books. And I think that it is a place that could be a place where we could not be normal because we've seen what being normal did to Israel. We've become very normal recently, especially for the <laughs> region we live in. So it's not the best. I think the word, the term shit show comes to mind, right? As a, so maybe it is time to, to, I think of the Tel Aviv Review books as a, as a, as a kind of a beacon of something else, some, uh, uh, a conversation that we 
grew up believing in, wanting, craving, that transcends the normal and the abnormal, that transcends the time. To me, this is the true essence of Zionism being Israel, is that kind of a, of a, of a spiritual, literary, intellectual a, a, a position in the world that, that makes it so important. And that's why I think what, what we experience here tonight is, a, to me, is the essence of, of this publication. And, uh, and it's not only a publication. For me, it's, it's almost a form of a movement and, uh, and, and a community in the, in the real sense of the word. Community is one of the most abused words in the contemporary American English right now. But this really is a global community of minds and souls that, uh, that crave and benefit from this this type of interaction and i i'm joining josh in saying we should help and make it make it re be, stay and afloat and and prosper and create more and more of this thank you wonderful thank you Ruby. We're going to go to Q&A. Um, questions about literature, um, cats, we're open to anything. And we've got a first question over here. Hi. Mayana, this is, by the way, this is wonderful. Thank you all. Mayana, I'm Mark Epstein, Vassar College. I'm just curious, in your translated version, yeah. reading back to the original, when you talked about her black hair, how did you describe it in Hebrew? I think mm. it's black as a raven. So are you quoting Shir Hashirim? Chapter mm. 5, verse 7. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, what Samaria you know, tells yeah, yeah, but, um, but you know, right. seriously? Yeah, it came, um, it's probably Derek Ahera. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Something else. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually, I doubted myself as I was telling you that I, uh, I was thinking yeah. about, about the, the influences, the direct literary references in the book and couldn't find anything not, biblical about yeah. it, I, I immediately told myself, Flaming there book. must be some uh, shit. Right. 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 But also, I think there's something very...